Okay, well, <coughs> perhaps we should make a start. Um, thank you for coming. Good afternoon. Um, the aim of the whole range of lectures over the three years of my tenure of this uh, professorship have got this theme in common, really, as to how uh, people with religious beliefs uh, relate to uh, the legal and economic aspects of a liberal society, and equally how uh, secular liberals uh, relate to those who have uh, religious beliefs. And in the first year of the lectures, I uh, gave some talks about the role and nature of values in relation to economic markets and uh, financial markets. And this, the aim of this series of lectures is to look more, more at the legal and uh, political implications of uh, the relationship between religion and the liberal state. And the thing that I want to start with is the idea of pluralism, uh, which can be moral pluralism, the idea that people differ quite markedly in terms of the values that they hold and the, what they regard as being good and bad, right and wrong. There can be cultural pluralism where people differ quite fundamentally on what sort of goods are genuine cultural goods and which sorts of cultural goods ought to be defended or protected or should be in the national curriculum or anything like that. Uh, there, there's also what you might call gender pluralism in the sense that while uh, gender is a more specific thing, uh, nevertheless, one's gender uh, can be manifested in many different ways of life, not all of them by any means being compatible with one another. So uh, pluralism is one of the basic sort of issues which the liberal wants to uh, try to address and to provide institutional, legal, governmental methods of dealing with and coping with uh, the fairly modern uh, emergence of this degree of pluralism in society. And many liberal thinkers, most notably the American philosopher John Rawls, have linked the defense of liberalism to lessons learned from the wars of religion in the uh, 16th and 17th century, uh, that these were uh, wars that laid waste to a large part of the central area of Europe, and they were fought because of uh, a failure to ad adapt to the, in the initial phase, as it were, of the breakdown of a monolithic uh, religious and because the religion was so deeply ingrained cultural and other kinds of identity. Uh, that, that, was, that, that, that those identities, those ways of life were broken down during the wars of religion which culminated in the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 and liberalism has emerged uh, in the West as being the most effective way of dealing with uh, fundamental differences of value, whether cultural, sexual, uh, religious and so forth. Um, and it's seen as a way, liberalism is seen very often as a way of coping with the diversity of values. And I want, in the first part of what I say today, just to uh, look at what kind of strategy that is. How does a liberal state deal with the diversity of values? Well, it does it in, in one respect in uh, following again the work of John Rawls by utilizing Rawls's insight, uh, which I shall disagree with as time goes on in this course, but, but Rawls's insight that uh, in, in a modern pluralistic society, we, in politics, we have to put the right before the good. Now you may you know, be a bit skeptical about that. What does it mean to put the right before the good? But it's a, it's a shorthand way of putting one of the central issues of liberal, legal, and governmental philosophy, if you like, uh, that we do disagree 
about what the good things in life are, what makes for human flourishing, uh, what, what is an acceptable way of life and so forth. So pluralism about the good doesn't mean that we are therefore catapulted into a kind of nihilistic world where we can't actually agree on other aspects of life. And what Rawls wants to suggest is that a liberal society should be one which frames a set of basic rules, if you like, constitutional rules, which everyone ought to be able to accept because they're based on open and rational grounds, not upon uh, insights drawn from revelation or cultural uh, insights or whatever. They are values which we could all sign up to from our different points of view, even though we differ about lots and lots of goods. Um, there, there are these basic goods, or what Rawls calls primary goods, that we can all actually agree on, and these can be protected by a legal constitutional framework. Now, at the heart of Rawls's framework, as you, you won't be surprised to learn in the context of arguments about liberalism, is the idea of individual liberty. Um, and, and individual liberty is, in a sense, a reflection of pluralism about goods and the diversity of goods. Because we disagree about these things, we should be free to follow what we think is a good way of life for ourselves. So long as in doing that, we don't harm or prevent other people pursuing what they regard as the good life from their point of view. And freedom is essential to the management, as it were, of pluralism. And it's a sense, a reflection of pluralism. If we can't agree or provide absolutely authoritative reasons why a particular good should be followed, then it seems to stand to reason that people should be free to follow whatever good it is that animates them, uh, rather than having to as it were, subordinate their idea of the good to somebody else's, which triumphs, as it were, in legislation or just in terms of public opinion and common uh, social life. Uh, so under the idea of putting the right before the good, what we are doing, essentially, is setting out a set of rules which will provide a framework within which individuals, from their own point of view, can follow out, follow through, what they regard as valuable and important in life, so long as in doing that they don't harm other people. Now you might say, well this is all very well, but it's a bit of an anodyne kind of principle because what does harm actually uh, consist in? And liberal thinkers are usually clear uh, that harm can't just mean offended sensibilities. There are lots of things that you encounter in life that you think are really nasty. Um, and, 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 you know, your sense of, uh, your sensibilities are, are outraged by something that's happening. Uh, but that's not enough to justify the coercion of the law for a liberal uh, defender. Because we should be able to distinguish between harm and offended sensibility. And the most fundamental form of harm on this view is that I am prevented by your actions from pursuing my conception of the good in my own way. That's what harm consists in, not the fact that you're just upset to see whatever it might be, I mean, new nudity on the television or violence on the television or whatever it might be. These are you know, issues that we need to talk about and think about. But unless you can show that those things make it impossible for you to live the sort of life that you want to live in your private realm, your private world, 
then you haven't been harmed. You, your, your sensibilities can have been offended, but you haven't been harmed. There must be some kind of objective basis to harm, not just I'm harmed if I say I'm harmed. There has to be some objective basis for harm if people are going to be coerced by the law into not doing what they would otherwise do because you have complained that that would be harmful. That's a perfectly legitimate claim to make, but it has to be substantiated. And substantiating harm is rather different from claiming that your sensibilities have been upset or outraged by something that's uh, been going on. But I, th So freedom is very important in this context, and because, because of pluralism, because of the diversity of value, it also follows that for a liberal, Freedom doesn't involve and cannot involve a legitimate role for the state in judging the use to which you put your freedom. You make your choices, I make my choices. The state has no role in evaluating, endorsing, or criminalizing those cho choices unless they harmfully affect other people. So the, the state has to stay its hand in terms of um, having, if you like, a sort of moral agenda about the ends, goals and purposes of life uh, which should be endorsed and which shouldn't and which can be prevented by the law. The only basis, and this of course is the famous theme of John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, the only basis for interfering in someone else's life is harm, harm to others. And harm, as I've suggested, isn't just a matter of offended sensibility. Now, pluralism, to go back to that point, and then coming back to the point I've just made, pluralism can take two forms. It can just be a kind of an observation that looking around modern society, you can just see that people differ about values and they have no ready way of reconciling their differences. If I say that something is unjust and you say, no, it isn't, it's perfectly fair, uh, we don't have any ready way of reconciling these differences. I mean, is Wonga charging, you know, is it an injustice that Wonga is charging all this interest? Or isn't it? I mean, how do we resolve these kinds of differences? And you can say, well, if you just look at society, look at the papers on any day of the week, you will see that pluralism is, as it were, just a fact of life. That's how things are now. But there is a deeper account of pluralism as well, which is found uh, particularly in the work of the uh, Oxford uh, thinker, now, now dead, Isaiah uh, Berlin, who argued that pluralism was considerably more than a fact. Uh, and what he argued was that there cannot be a way, not just that there isn't a way, but there cannot be a way of rationally resolving conflicts of value. Um, that there is no single account that can be given, no monistic account, no universal account of what is good and bad, right and wrong, valuable, disvaluable, and we cannot rank values in some kind of hierarchy. We can't say justice is more important than freedom or equality is more important than justice or whatever. We can make these decisions about these rankings for ourselves. I can make a choice about whether I'm going to see issues of equality as being more important than issues of freedom, let's say. But there is no mechanism, and can be no mechanism, within society for producing some kind of ultimate and authoritative uh, account of the hierarchy of values. Now, if that's so, if pluralism is deeper than just a fact, but it is also about the nature of values, it's a, a kind of truth about the nature of values, that they conflict and that they can't be reconciled together. 
if that, if that account is right, then of course liberal, liberalism almost immediately follows from it as an appropriate response to that sort of world, if that sort of account about value is correct. Um, I mean, obviously within individuals' own consciences and within the life of a kind of sub-state institution like a church or whatever it might be, people can uh, uh, rank values as they like and churches can rank values as they like. But at the level of society and government, we have no way of endorsing one set of values over another, no mechanism for recognising the legitimacy of one hierarchy of values over another. So if, if that's how we're living, if that's the world we're living in, then uh, there is no real obvious alternative uh, to liberalism which says here is the framework of society in which basic rights are protected and within that framework you can go ahead and pursue your own good in your own way so long as in doing that you're not um, harming others although you may be offending others and uh, that there is some kind of um, objectivity about harm in, in that kind of way. Now, it also follows, in a sense, from the points about pluralism, whether you regard it just as a fact or as something deeper, as Isaiah Berlin does, it follows from that, that there is a strong reason for the state to be neutral between values, or to use the terminology that Rawls introduced into this sort of discussion, uh, being neutral between different conceptions of the good. Because after all, if we differ about our conceptions of the good, and if there is no authoritative way of reconciling conflicting values, then if the state favoured one conception of the good over another, it would be behaving unfairly to those people whose value system isn't represented in that choice that the state had made. So if the state, on this view, uh, regarded itself as essentially a Christian institution, let's say, then it is breaching one of the basic principles of a, a, a kind of liberal approach to government and politics, which is uh, that because we can't agree on conceptions of the good, the state should not be endorsing one as opposed to another way of life or a uh, view of what gives value to life. So on that, that basis, the state has to be neutral. It cannot uh, endorse one particular value system. Nor can it endorse a kind of um, whatever the basic underlying justification of that value system would be, Christian theology or evolutionary theory or whatever it might be, because it's not the state's job to be doing that. The state's job is to maintain the framework of rights within which individuals can pursue these goods in their own way. It's not the state's job to endorse the justification of one set of values over another. Um, and of course this fits in also with what I talked about last year about the nature of the market order because again the market order does not favour any particular kind of outcome. It's individuals making the, cho the choices that they make and the outcomes are merely aggregate reflections on all those choices that individuals make. So neither in politics nor in economics in a liberal society should we be looking for some particular pattern of life or for some particular pattern of outcomes. Rather, we just have to accept that within the framework of the market, within the framework of the state, individuals are then free to follow their own preferences 
and that's sort of uh, all there is to it. It also follows from this view, um, and this is quite important in, 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 in some ways, it also follows from this view that our idea of what it is to be a citizen, a full citizen of a liberal society, has got absolutely nothing to do with these sorts of beliefs about what is good and bad, right and wrong. Citizenship is about adherence to the basic framework of law, the basic rights and obligations of a liberal society. It's not about seeing the society as being Christian or Islamic or whatever else it might be. Citizenship is detached from these beliefs and the rub there is that the liberal is inclined to say it's detached from these beliefs because those beliefs are private beliefs which we have no way of giving a final judgment on. You know, these are matters, uh, the religious beliefs and so forth are not things that we can say, well, they're absolutely true from the, you know, from the point of view of the state or they're absolutely false. These things are private beliefs and our citizenship, our common citizenship as members of UK now has nothing to do with our private, religious and other sorts of beliefs. And that I should, as a citizen of a liberal society, according to a thinker like Rawls, I should be able to go through the whole of my life as a member of that society, as a citizen of that society, and nothing that happens in terms of my private belief, I, mean, I might change my religion every, you know, every three or four years, or I might change my political allegiance every now and again, whatever. None of those private beliefs has the slightest thing to do with your membership, your uh, relationship, to the state. So what we've got to do is to look for a conception of citizenship that is justified by purely general considerations and not by arguments drawn from, let's say, religious belief or whatever else it might be. You know, I can have the most eccentric religious beliefs and, and still be a full citizen because citizenship only requires adherence to these general basic rules set out in something a bit like a constitution. And of course you might say, well of course Britain doesn't have that sort of constitution, but it's certainly moving in that direction, um, largely because of what happens across the road in the courts following the Equality Act and the Human Rights Act, that these are now seen by many judges as being part of a kind of rather ad hoc and somewhat crabwise movement towards Britain having a set of basic laws and a kind of constitutional order. Now, if you argued for the moment, without, in my case, endorsing it, that in fact the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act do provide a, a basic framework then you've moved a long way towards this liberal position. Citizenship means living under the acceptance of these basic rules. It's got nothing to do with the other sorts of values, important though they are, which other people might have and hold on to. So uh, citizenship, neutrality, pluralism, all these ideas go together really for the liberal. Now there is a, a kind of an argument against this, which I'll just touch on. Uh, I'll come to more critical things later on, but this fits in quite well with just where we, we've got to at the moment. Uh, an argument put forward, uh, first of all, by Professor Ronald Dworkin now, uh, who sadly died uh, earlier this year. And his argument was this, in terms of how religious people should um, think about their position in relation to the legal framework of a, uh, uh, of, of a liberal uh, political order. And it was this, that 
if I, if I made a, say I'm not, uh, I, 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 I'm not remotely a religious person, let, let's say that, uh, I, I mean I am, but I mean let's assume that I'm not for the moment, um, I may then think, well, you know, what, what am I after in life? Well, uh, there are various things that I would like to achieve and do, and I think that these things are good. I don't have any view about how other people should leave their, their, lead their lives. Let's assume that that's how I feel. Uh, that as far as I'm concerned, uh, I mean, in terms of sexuality or whatever, I'm heterosexual, I'm monogamous and so on, and these are all important values to me. But I don't have any view about how you should live your lives in terms of sexual morality or whatever else it might be. And that is fair enough on a Dworkin view. But let's assume that somebody else is from a religious community that has a very strong view, a critical view of non-heterosexual sexuality. On Dworkin's view, that person wants both to follow his own preferences and also have preferences about how other people should live their lives. Now, in Dworkin's view, this is utterly unjust because, in my case, only my preferences about my, my own life are counted whereas in the case of the person belonging to this religious community, the pre his preferences about his own life and his preferences about other people's lives are being counted. And this sort of, tra tra uh, th this sort of undermines critically a basic democratic principle that people should count for one and only one, as Jeremy Bentham, the 18th century political theorist, put it, that you should only have your preferences counted once. Whereas if I have preferences about how you should live your life, then I'm asking the political order, as it were, the state or whatever, to count my preferences twice. The preference that I have for myself and the preference that I have for somebody else. Uh, well, all other people. And this is utterly unjust because it means that at the heart of <coughs> democratic politics there is double counting and an infringement of the basic idea that each person should count for one but not more than one. So if you put all these ideas together, including the Dworkin one, it, you get a, a fairly straightforward uh, sort of picture of politics. Basic rights which defend all our liberties and other things like religious freedom, but also a space, a public space, within which we can pursue our own goals in our own way without those goals being subject to assessment, assessment criticism or endorsement by uh, the powers that be. Now you might say, well, how, how do we, if, if, that, if, if this pluralism is so all-pervasive, how do we get to an agreement about these basic rights and so forth? And here I think the, uh, the, there's a, a straightforward kind of argument from the liberal uh, that actually gets uh, into some hard going uh, and, and not very plausible going uh, fun, uh, eventually. One of the ideas that is invoked in terms of how do you justify the basic rules, the rights and so forth of a liberal society, one of the ideas that's central here is that of what, again, sorry to keep citing him, but John Rawls, who's the person who's written most about this, calls public reason. And public reason is about um, justification of political policies uh, and, and basic, sorry, I should have said basic 
policies in relation to things like rights and so forth that we can all agree about because they don't involve controversial moral and, if you like, metaphysical claims like religious belief and so forth. That to the, 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 the basic rights that Rawls is talking about rest on what he calls public reason and public reason does not include uh, controversial and irresolvable doctrines of one sort or another, what he calls comprehensive doctrines, that in politics we should be prepared, all of us as citizens, to, as it were, not insist upon our, um, on the importance of our comprehensive beliefs in relation to political activity, because these are bound to lead to conflict. What we have to do more, in Rawls's view, in relation to basic rights, is to say, well, look, we can all accept these basic rights because they're based upon uh, commonsensical um, understandings, or at least shared understandings. But once you start bringing religious views and whatever into the debate about things like rights, you will get controversy and controversies that can never be resolved. They can only be resolved by the exercise of power. But the majority says, let's say to the religious person, look, we've got the power you haven't, we're not recognising your contribution in this. <coughs> now, this is very uncomfortable for a liberal because part of liberalism has been the idea that um, sorry, Mina, that um, has been the idea that polit political power should be subject to justification. Power for a liberal isn't just something you impose on people. You try to justify it including justifying it to the person you're about to exercise the power over. Because otherwise, um, there is nothing sort of very moral about liberalism. You know, why should liberalism's view of politics and rights and so forth trump everything else? Well, it trumps everything else if you can actually justify it to people who might otherwise be adversely affected by uh, that exercise of power. You can say, you can, ju you, you, you know, that we're doing this because, and you will either accept it or you won't, but at least there is an attempt at justification. And it, this is part of what Rawls means by, by public reason, that, that the institutions of a liberal society have to be justified to all members of a liberal society, including those whose beliefs may be excluded, as in the case of religion, from the, 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 the neutral public realm. On a sort of strong reading of this kind of argument. Now, on this view, why should we be excluding religious belief? from the neutral state, from the public realm. Well, the argument there is that religious beliefs are inherently private commitments. And we can, in terms of our basic rights, recognize an absolute right to freedom of religious belief. But that's different from accepting a right to the practice of religious belief in the public realm. And the reason for that is that, that other people who don't share the religious belief can't then necessarily um, accept the justification that you give as a religious person for the belief that you have and which you are now wanting to influence what goes on in the public realm through. 
So, I mean, the obvious example over the past generation or so, particularly in the United States, less so but still here, is abortion. Um, and the argument in, in the United States has very largely turned upon the idea that um, the religious arguments against abortion should not play a, rel a, a role in the public realm because they are based upon a comprehensive doctrine which many people do not recognize as being coherent or intelligible or rational. And that in those circumstances where there is a belief that cannot be subject to normal rational assessment, then it should play no part in the public deliberations of a liberal society, that rather the belief should be regarded as very important because it's protected by a right to religious freedom, but it can't be imported into the public realm because the arguments that should count in the public realm are those that are compatible with the idea of public reason, that is, reasons that we can all acknowledge, that we can all share whereas notoriously that isn't the case in relation to religion. It would also apply, just to be even-handed about this, it would also apply just as uh, equally to secularism, because secularism is a comprehensive doctrine for which there is no greater um, justification in the view of many people than there is for, re for religion. The secularist view being you know, that only the sort of propositions of science and um, uh, factual uh, accumulation are uh, legitimate and, and that there is nothing to anything that falls outside the realm of science and ordinary observational uh, fact gathering. That is as much a comprehensive doctrine as is, say, Roman Catholicism or something like that on this view of it. So it, 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 the, the, the idea of public reason wouldn't satisfy the Roman Catholic, but it also ought not to satisfy the secularist um, because it, uh, it applies across, the, re across the, the piece that all values that are debated, that play a role in the public realm, should be subject to a common standard of intelligibility, and justification, and so on. So we get to this position then that neutrality, pluralism, uh, public reason, and so forth all go together to produce a secular, but not secularist, public space. And I say that because it's not justified by secularism it's justified on the grounds that the public reason which underpins any constitutional order has to be something that we can all agree about. Uh, and that isn't true either of secularism or of uh, religion. Now, the big question then arises, if this is the kind of picture of a liberal society, where religion is protected, religious belief is protected in an absolute way, I would say under Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights, an absolute right to freedom of belief. But there is no absolute right to the practice of a belief because the practice of that belief might harm, harm other people. Um, and there are, certain, certain, there are circumstances where that might be true. It's not saying you cannot practice your belief, but what it is saying is that it is then no longer a private belief and it has to be assessed as to whether it will or won't cause harm to others. And there could be scenarios in which people do regard the practicing of a belief as causing harm. And you know these are the subjects of lots of uh, legal cases that have been going on over the past few years, particularly in terms of things like Islamic dress codes and wearing crosses at work and, and all that kind of thing. So, on this view, um, there can be an absolute right to freedom of belief, 
but a conditional right to practice or manifest that belief. And that this is perfectly reasonable from a liberal point of view because the practice or the manifestation of a belief may cause harm to others. Uh, but you would have to show that it caused harm, and if it didn't cause harm, then the religious person should be entirely free to manifest that religious point of view. But this is quite different from saying that a religious point of view should be given some kind of special recognition in the legal or political order, uh, or in the public realm, as it were. But it can be, it can be defended by basic rights to all sorts of beliefs, because it's not just religious belief that has, you have an absolute right to, but also any philosophical belief, according to Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights. But, as I say, the manifestation of the belief is conditional. Now, the rub comes here. If a particular manifestation of a belief is thought to be intrinsic to the belief itself, and that the courts, as it were, strike down that manifestation of belief because it is thought to harm others, then isn't that infringing the absolute right to freedom of belief if this way of manifesting it is thought to be uh, central to it? So, uh, to take an example that I took uh, in the previous lecture, if, uh, if it's part of Islamic belief that a, a Muslim has to pray facing Mecca five times a day, then that isn't just a kind of detachable aspect of Islamic belief. It's central to the belief that, that, that those people have. And, and to restrict the right to pray is to restrict the right to belief, because you can't separate out the belief on the one hand and the manifestation on the other. And the same would go for uh, all sorts of other religious practices. Now, these are highly contentious in modern society uh, because there are lots of cases where, <coughs> and again, particularly to do with Islamic dress, um, people have complained and taken to law various public institutions as infringing freedom of religion because they've infringed, that they've infringed the right of the, right in inverted commas, of the Muslim adherent to wear this garb rather than that garb. Now, this becomes a very difficult business in the law because what you then have to establish is whether wearing the, the, the apparel is as much an internal requirement of Islam as praying five times a day. If you say that wearing these clothes is absolutely intrinsic to the belief, then not allowing people to wear those clothes is to contravene the principle of the absolute nature of religious belief. But of course there's a great deal of controversy not about praying five times a day, but there is a lot of controversy about Islamic uh, dress and so on. And the same could be true of uh, Christian uh, churches and so on. It just so happens that most of the cases have been um, uh, drawn from Islamic uh, practices. But there was certainly one, I can't remember the name of the, um, of the person concerned, but it was a young a adolescent uh, girl at a school which had a strict uniform policy who insisted on wearing a, one of these chastity rings that are popular in the United States uh, as a manifestation of her religion. And uh, the school uh, suspended her because she wouldn't take it off. And, the, and it was inconsistent with their uniform policy. And the courts... Uh, Backed the school rather than the young woman concerned. Now, there would be a case of the court saying wearing a chastity ring is not an intrinsic requirement of Christian belief, and therefore, because it's not an intrinsic requirement, 
to reject the claim is not to infringe religious freedom, which only applies to the belief plus any kind of completely intrinsic <coughs> practice of that belief. And this might apply to all sorts of uh, religious uh, apparel and so on. And of course, that in turn raises the question that I want to deal with a bit more next time, but I'll just sort of flag it up for the moment. And it's this, um, I talked about it a bit in the first lecture, which was an attempt to sort of give a bit, a bit of a synopsis of everything I was trying to cover. But the, the, the point uh, it, it, that, that comes out of all of this is that the position of religion in a liberal society does become pretty problematic for the reasons I've tried to explain. Problematic in terms of the public realm, problematic in terms of religious people having preferences about how other people should live their lives, uh, issues about what is intrinsic to a religious belief and what isn't, and so on. And the courts are now uh, grappling with a great many of these questions. But the, the underlying this is the issue of, well, what gives a liberal state the right to do all this kind of thing? What's special about liberalism? Because, after all, if we live in a world of value pluralism, in which you can't actually provide ultimate foundations and grounds for one's value system, whatever it might be, what is it that gives liberalism this privilege? What is it that privileges the position of liberalism if it seems to be the case that we can't provide concrete foundations for our beliefs and our values, whatever they are? And this is a problem for liberalism because, as I said, it's fairly important, well, it's very important for liberals not to um, accept that liberalism is just a system of power like any other. Unlike any other, it aims to be able to justify itself even to those who are disadvantaged by the operation of a liberal political order and perhaps, for example, in that context, uh, religious people. So it's a very big issue as to how you can in fact justify uh, liberalism. Is it justified just as a kind of coping mechanism? You know, it helps us to cope with diversity and pluralism. Or is it justified by um, it being just a kind of historical achievement of Western society. Well, you know, this is how things have developed. We can't give it any rational foundation, but this is how it's developed, and this is how we do things round here, to quote Richard Rorty, the American philosopher. You know, that, it, that, that liberalism and liberal institutions are just, as it were, historical creations. They don't have any justification beyond that. Or are liberal institutions more like a modus vivendi, that we've got religious people, we've got secular people sort of jockeying for position in society. We can't resolve the fundamental philosophical issues at stake between them. But what we can do is to provide a sort of framework of law that will allow them to pursue their own point of view without as it were, causing harassment and problems to each side of the, uh, each side of the argument. So is, is, is liberalism a, a, a modus vivendi? Um, or is it itself a comprehensive moral doctrine? And if it is, then what happens to the idea that liberalism is the sort of solvent of pluralism because liberalism becomes part of the problem of pluralism because it is itself a moral ideal or a moral doctrine that has the idea of autonomy and individual liberty at its heart. Now, it's perfectly open to somebody 
who doesn't share that view to say, well, you know, what's so great about this? Why should the fundamental driver of liberal institutions be the protection of individual autonomy? There are other human values that are of very great importance, and they should be protected as well, including, for example, the role of religion in human life. So there is a big issue there. If, if liberalism is, well, I won't say forced, but if one of the options for the justification of liberalism is that liberals themselves take the view that liberalism is a moral doctrine and not just one of these <coughs> other coping mechanisms, that if liberalism is itself a moral doctrine, then it's one of the contending doctrines. It's not somehow above it all, but rather it becomes itself subject to disagreement and discord as part of the framework of a pluralistic society and cannot hope to have the legitimacy uh, to solve <coughs> these problems of well, what in the United States are called culture wars um, but which are, are very bitterly fought there and may be growing more bitter here. Um, so I think we're going to have to finish, I'm sorry. No, we're going to have to finish, sorry. Well, thank you.